In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe that the Bible is God's revelation of his way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. My friend, it's great to have you join our Bible study In Search of the Lord's Way. I pray we'll both be blessed by it. Last week I told you about three people who were baptized. One because of the broadcast and the tape ministry, and another because of the broadcast and the printing ministry, and the third after studying through our Bible correspondence course. I want to read you another kind of letter. It came by email. It says, Dear Brother Lyon, I needed your sermon today. It helped me make a decision that has been a long time in coming. I am a baptized believer that has fallen away from Christ. Your sermon today has reminded me of the love and contentment that I knew while I was living in Christ. In your sermon today, you said that a Christian can stand any temptation if the Lord is with him, and that's so true. The Lord has not been with me because I walked away from him. Today I'm going to run back to our Lord, and I know that our Savior will forgive my sins and receive me back into his loving arms. Life is too short to live without the love of God. Thank you again for being there and telling me what I needed to hear. I just had to read you that letter. He said it better than I did. Life is too short to live it without the love of God. My, oh my, how true that is. Thank you, brother, for taking the time to write, and may God bless you. Today we bring to a close the study we've made of Paul's sermon on Mars Hill. Actually, we completed our study of the sermon itself last week. But this one has to do with the responses uh, the people made to that preaching. There are some relevant thoughts there for us here today, too. We're giving it the title, Some Mocked, Some Delayed, Some Believed. Then next week, we'll go on with some other things some that you're concerned about. Right now, Ken Heldbrand is going to lead us as we sing, then I'll be back.
In the 22nd verse, Acts 17, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious or very religious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. In him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own points have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the God that is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed, and among which was Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Now let's go to God in prayer. Our Father, we are so pleased that we have the privilege of studying this great message that reveals so much about you so that we can enjoy closer communion with you, better understanding. We confess our limitations and uh, our personal limitations and our finite limitations because we are attempting to understand the infinite. We pray, though, that you'll bless our studies, and we pray those who have been with us in each of these has been blessed and drawn nearer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. was never permitted to finish his sermon on Mars Hill. Luke says, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, well, he was interrupted. It's as J.W. McGarvey says in his commentary on Acts, page 130, that it was a strange feature of his audience that they listened quietly while Paul was demonstrating the folly of their idolatrous worship, which we could naturally expect them to defend. But they interrupted him at the mention of the resurrection of Christ. Such behavior suggests a lesser commitment to their deities, their idols and temples and shrines, than to the wisdom for which they were most proud. Then it wasn't really that devotion to their gods, in other words, their religious faith that kept them from receiving the gospel Paul preached. It was their love of wisdom. And isn't that the case in our enlightened 20th century culture as well? Well, it may be just a quirk of human nature, but it's interesting, too, that, uh, that, that the reason Paul was summoned to appear before the Areopagite in the first place was that earlier in the marketplace 
He had preached to them Jesus and the resurrection, and they had responded by saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. That's verses 18 and 19. You'd think from that that they wanted to hear more about Jesus and the resurrection, wouldn't you? But that must not have been the case. But then, neither the Epicureans or the Stoics, the two groups who had challenged him, believed in a life beyond this one. You remember the Epicureans were both materialists and hedonists, whose philosophy was best summed up in the statement, let us eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And the other group, the Stoics, held that the world is the body of God and God is the soul of the world, which is plain materialism. So religiously, Paul's teaching might have been acceptable, but philosophically, they simply were not ready for a message about someone who had been dead and was resurrected who, and who promises life beyond the grave for all who believe in him. Such talk was foolishness to them. Well, Paul knew that. He wrote the Corinthians, many of whom also trusted in their wisdom that the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews, a stumbling block. Under the Greeks, foolishness. But under them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Well, there were three responses to Paul's sermon. First, some mocked. The New American Standard Version has it that some began to sneer. Philip's translation says some even burst out laughing. Well, whatever the derision, whatever form the derision took, mocking, sneering, jeering, laughing, whatever it must have been. It must have been disturbing enough to force an end to the discourse. It constituted total rejection of the doctrine that's the heart and the soul of Christianity. Yes, Paul was right. It was foolishness to them, but he had to preach it to them because that's the gospel, that's the power of God, the salvation to everyone that believes, the Jew first and also the Greek. Paul was not the first preacher of Christ who had been unable to complete his sermon because of rejection. Remember, last week we mentioned Stephen's sermon to the Jews in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 7. He was saying, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have now been the betrayers and the murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears, and they ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes that young man's feet whose name was Saul, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, saying, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And uh, when he had said this, he fell asleep. Wow. 
What a strong message. And with equally as strong results. What do you suppose would happen in modern American religion if a preacher were to be that direct about uh, confronting the people with their sin and their rejection of Christ? Uh, we probably never know. But he'd very likely draw the same response. People would likely call him a radical or a bigot or religious right, and they might even go beyond that. Some of Stephen's highly educated, polished critics say, well, with a little diplomacy, you know, he might have saved his own life as well as some lost souls. What's so hard for our pluralistic heart to comprehend is that souls must be confronted with their sin in order to be saved. We just cannot dance sophisticatedly around the subject of sin and convict men of sin and their need of a Savior. It was said of Abraham Lincoln that after he had returned from church one Sunday, he was asked what the minister had preached about that day. And Lincoln said, well, the best he could determine, it was something about sin. Was he for it or against it, someone asked. And Lincoln replied, well, it was hard to tell, but I think he was against it. Well, it wasn't that way with New Testament preachers. Well, some mocked, and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. Whether they really intended to do so, I suppose we'll never know. They might have been just getting rid of Paul like we do some telemarketing someone who calls during dinner. So the second response to Paul's sermon was uh, procrastination. That too is a pretty general response. <laughs> You may have seen the Sunday comic strip three or four weeks ago. I don't remember just what Sunday it was, and I don't remember which strip it was, but the son was asking his father to define procrastination for him. And the father said, son, I've been intending to look that up for years. Well, and that's what we're talking about, putting off, putting off becoming a Christian. I remember another of Paul's sermons that was interrupted. You may remember, too, when Paul was in prison in Caesarea, in Acts chapter 24, verses 24 through 25, the Bible says, After certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. If anyone ever needed to hear a sermon on righteousness, temperance, and self or self-control and judgment to come, it was Governor Felix. His relationship with Drusilla was an adulterous one, which he needed to get out of. Sometimes, you know, even kings and governors and others in high position need to hear about such things as these. And as it was characteristic of Paul in his preaching, he addressed the governor's need. And it's obvious from the reading that, that, that Felix felt the impact of that message very strongly. He trembled at what he heard. He knew very well Paul was right. He interrupted him. He didn't become angry as Stephen's audience did. He didn't mock as some of the Athenians did. He simply put off, doing what he was convinced he needed to do. When I have a convenient season, I will call for you. A convenient time, I will call for you. How many people? I have heard to say that. But my friend, you'll never find a convenient time to repent and turn to the Lord. The devil's going to see to that. That's why the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Hebrews 3 and 9. Don't put it off. Of the Athenians who heard the greatest preacher that the church has ever had, besides the Lord himself, of course, some mocked, some procrastinated, and some believed. 
The word believed here doesn't mean it simply that they concurred with Paul or, or received his message or gave polite nod in the direction of Jesus. As the rest of the context indicates, it means that they made a commitment to what he said. The Holy Spirit says certain men clave unto Paul, and he singles out Dionysius, who was probably one of the judges on the Areopagus court. He also names Damaris, a woman. For what reason, we're not quite sure, but she must have been some well-known person, perhaps a woman of some political or educational or religious or social prominence of that day. Perhaps she was a philosopher. And there were others, too. Oh, you remember when the Apostle Peter was preaching on that day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, that right when he was saying, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ, he too was interrupted. Verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. This is the same thought as in Acts chapter 7 in the case of Stephen where it said they were cut to the heart. In fact, some versions translate Acts chapter 2 verse 37, they were cut to the heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Some modern preachers would have asked, Do? What do you mean do? There's nothing you can do to be saved. But Peter answered, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission or the forgiveness of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And guess what? As many as gladly received the word were baptized. Verse 41. They did. And as many as gladly received God's word even now do the same thing. There were about 3,000 of them who that very day were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ whom they'd helped to crucify less than two months earlier. What's your response to the gospel, my friend? Will you laugh at it, mock or scorn it, or procrastinate? Or will you embrace the message of salvation and commit yourself to Jesus Christ who is the author and finisher of our faith as the people did on Pentecost. Pray with me, will you? Loving Father, we're thankful that you're willing to receive us when we re repent of our sins and turn away from them and turn back to you. Thank you for the person whose letter we read earlier and for others like that who will today come back and enjoy your love and friendship and fellowship once more in the rest of their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. It seems to me the conclusion to a series of studies in Paul's Mars Hill sermon just has to be a focus on our own personal response to God. The sermon is about God and about knowing God as God really is and our personal relationship with Him. We know we've only touched the hem of the garment. We're uncomfortably conscious of our personal limitations as well as our inherent finite inability to know finite, infinite reality. But it's been a great concern of mine in a half a century of ministry to see even the church more and more distancing itself from God. I believe it was a preacher by the name of Vance Havner who said back in the 60s that most churches could do everything they're doing even if there were no God. And the drift away from God has reached stampede proportions since then. The great showman P.T. Barnum 
is often quoted as saying that the American people love to be humbugged. And that's especially true of American religionists. They'll accept almost anything if it's marketed behind the label of religion. Consequently, God, as he's seen in the scripture, had to be abandoned. He had become too old-fashioned, too traditional, too restrictive, too cumbersome for a modern progressive church. Churches have had to mold for themselves new images of God who will placate the politically correct demand of a degenerate and decaying society. Many churches rejected worship in worship and awe, in reverence and awe as we're taught in the scriptures to do. That leads worshipers right up to the throne of the majesty in the heavens in favor of contemporary worship forms that appeal particularly to the flesh, music and dancing and laughing and all of that, making the audience feel good about itself and its sins. Well, I hope we've caused someone or two or more churches or people to pause in the mad race toward total destruction and total apostasy, to rethink the effect of this insane trivializa trivialization of almighty, all-loving, all-knowing, completely holy God, creator, sovereign, Father in heaven, and repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge all of us for what we have done. May he bless these messages to that end. We hope to have these published in a book form one of these days and make them available through religious bookstores along with other books we've written. You may be watching for them. You may have a free transcript or audio cassette tape of today's message by writing us In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma 73083. Our email address is searchtv at aol.com. Please request the sermon titled Some Mocked, Some Delayed, Some Believed. That's today's message. You don't need to send money. They're free gifts from your friends in Churches of Christ. If you prefer, you may use our toll-free telephone number, 1-800-321-8633. We're sincerely glad you were with us today. I hope you'll do it again next week. God bless you and keep you now. We do love you.